Okay, am I on? Okay, well, welcome everyone. This is exciting for me because this is the first live audience I've had in two months, I guess. And so this is good. You know, it, it's interesting to record uh, because when, you're, when you don't have people in front of you because I'm used to bouncing things off of you, asking questions to give me time to drink my coffee. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's nice to have some feedback to see, okay, are you understanding it? Do you know where we are? Are you awake? Uh, you know, what is, <laughs> what's going on here? And so, uh, you know, not having that and trying to pretend that you have an amphitheater full of people is sort of uh, difficult. Uh, but anyway, I guess we're a little bit beyond that. We're, I guess, you know, some people might say we're at the halfway point because you can get 50% of the people uh, in various places. Uh, I'm not sure what the difference is between 50% and 75% other than a number of some sort. Uh, of course, everyone is concerned because the number of cases in Texas is rising. Interesting that uh, according to the news that I saw and the articles I read that it's really affecting uh, people under 30 now. Uh, and not so much in our age group, uh, but people under 30, because I guess they're the ones that gave up on social distancing and, you know, once uh, Memorial Day hit, uh, everybody was out and about. Uh, of course, we've learned a few things during this time, uh, how to order groceries online. <laughs> And uh, in fact, uh, we're so sophisticated now that we'll start a list and after two or three days when we get our $30 or whatever the magic moment, uh, magic amount is, uh, then we'll say, okay, we want to kind of pick it up. And uh, so we'll go, and so we do that with uh, Wally World, H-E-B, uh, Kroger. And so I could probably write a column on the various delivery or, or the various pickup services uh, around town. Uh, but anyway, we are surviving, aren't we? Mm -hmm. We are well. We are doing well. Uh, and I think that uh, one day some there will be several books written on this 2020 pandemic, uh, promoting various theories and what went right, what went wrong, or whatever. But we will have survived, and hopefully we'll come out on the other end better, uh, stronger, and you know our faith will be reinforced. Uh, doing for others will be reinforced. Uh, remember when we started Romans, uh, we started talking about that, uh, you know, uh, Sometimes when we're in periods like this, it strengthens our character and our love for one another. And that's what we have to uh, keep hold of and keep in the forefront. So we're finishing the study of Romans. Uh, some of you have said, hey, we've been here a long time. Well, yeah. Uh, Romans is one of those books that is, has so much in it that uh, you could study it for years and not, you know, plumb all the depths of it. And as I said in the beginning, that you know, Romans was written to a church that really had no conflict. It wasn't until several years later that the Emperor Nero started persecuting the Church of uh, Christians and, and Rome, and so it's an interesting letter in that respect because when you look at Corinthians and some of the other letters Paul read, wrote, he was writing to them. Why? Because they had problems. In fact, the Corinthians had so many problems, he had to write them twice. And uh, so uh, this one is unique in that he is just sort of laying it all out. His entire ministry all the things that the Holy Spirit has guided him to say to them, building them up, showing them, talking to them. And uh, 
really uh, giving his all to the Romans in this letter, to a church that really he never went to. He didn't start this church. Uh, he finally did go to Rome, but we don't know that he visited the church. Why? He was a prisoner. <laughs> When he finally went to Rome, it was as a prisoner, not as a missionary. Uh, so uh, he was incarcerated. So we don't know that he ever, you know, that he was probably visited by people in the church of Rome uh, because they had his letter, you know, wanted to talk to him and they ministered to him and everything else. But he may have never darkened the doors of whatever building they had for the church of Rome. And uh, he begins chapter 15, that's where we are today, chapter 15, uh, as he ended chapter 14, which you all studied last week, in which he emphasized not judging others, uh, that the strong, the strong Christians help the weak, both physically and spiritually, and Throughout all of his letters to the Corinthians, Philippians, Ephesians, all of them, he always expressed and strove to bring the church to unity. And as he ends in chapter 14, as we begin in 15, it's with a spirit of unity. Whatever problem you have, whatever uh, divisive this you have, set it aside, get over it, discuss it, come to an agreement, and be unified. You know, are churches destroyed more from the outside or the inside? Yeah, the inside. The inside. It's when we have controversy, division, disunity, that's when all of these, you know, the church starts having real problems. And in fact, as a growing up as a Southern Baptist, I think half our churches were started from disunity. <laughs> One faction would get mad and go out and start another church. Okay, well, that's a way of church planning. Now, probably not the best way, but it is one way. Sorry, churches. Not the one that I would recommend because it usually leaves both churches pretty weak. Okay, someone, I guess, for the, for the benefit of the microphone, I guess I need to read the verses today. So we'll begin in chapter 15 and verse 14. And it says, I myself am convinced, my brothers, that ye that you yourselves are full of goodness, complete in knowledge, and competent to instruct one another. It's interesting because in some of Paul's other letters, what does he do? You know, he sort of beats on a little bit. Why are you doing this? You're distressing me. You're doing blah blah blah, and it's wrong. Get it corrected. I don't want this division within you. Here he's actually developing a softer tone and commending them for what? Teaching each other. Pardon? Teaching each other. Teaching each other. Their goodness. Their good motives. Their complete knowledge. Now I'm not sure he was talking about their deep theological understanding of the Bible, or well, they didn't have the Bible, or they had the Old Testament, but you know, they, he, he wasn't commending them for their scholarship or their deep understanding or that. I think it was, uh, they understood the basics, the gospel. You know, they knew the gospel and what it meant to be saved, have faith and understanding of what God was doing and the Holy Spirit was doing in their lives. And they could use that 
He says to instruct others, but I think it's also to sort of, we would use the word maybe evangelize. You know, they could, you know, the, the ones that, that had been Christians for a while could use it to instruct the younger Christians or the new Christians. And also when they were out in the marketplace or whatever else, use it as a way to evangelize or tell others about the gospel. I think that was their deep understanding. They knew. In fact, uh, if, if any of you uh, ever heard of or used the Roman road as a means to tell someone about Christ. One, the Roman road. It's a, it's a series of scriptures taken from Romans, and we'll, we'll read them to help others understand salvation and lead them to Christ. The first of these is Roman 3.23. Someone look up that and read that. I'll let y'all read that. I'm not going to. You at home should take up your Bibles and read these. Romans 3.23. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of glory of God. Okay. For all have sinned and fall, fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, you know, uh, Romans 6, 23. Okay, for the wages of sin is death, but eternal life is through Jesus Christ our Lord. So when you're talking to somebody, if you want to use some of these Bible verses, you can say, none of us are perfect. All have sinned, but, and, and, the, and the wages of sin, and, you know, the, the result of sin is death, but through Jesus Christ, we can have something else. Romans 5, 8. That God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Right. But God, you know, in his outstanding love for us, provided his son, Jesus Christ, as a sacrifice for us. Uh, Romans 8, 9 through 10. Must be 10. Uh, did I write it wrong? Uh, Romans 10, 9 through 10. Is that what he's trying to call on the name of the Lord? Uh, let me make sure I didn't write it down. Did you declare with your mouth? Ah, that's the one. Yeah. If you, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. Right. It is with your mouth that you profess your faith and you are saved. Okay. If you declare and if you say and truly believe with your heart and then express it with your mouth then you will be saved see how the road progresses you know for all have sinned but god has provided a sacrifice for us if you declare then you will be saved romans 10 13. all who call out to the lord will be saved Okay. Now this is the Roman road. That's one way. Now, I know David uses ABC. <laughs> uh, you know, there are various other methods of, uh, you know, uh, helping others using the Bible. But I thought it'd be good if you'd never heard of the Roman road to have these verses. Because it's a very, you know, progressive uh, uh, way of showing others that, hey, for all have sinned. I mean, none of us are perfect. 
but God has provided a way. And if you believe and you declare, then you will be saved and you will have eternal life. So, you know, Paul used this throughout Romans to show the gospel to and remind the people, uh, Christians in Rome, of the gospel that they were declaring. Okay, so that was the Roman road. And so he was uh, commending them for their goodness, for their knowledge, and for the instructions of others. Uh, and he knew that the church was not perfect. You know, he wasn't saying in this that you've got a great perfect church here. No, he wasn't saying that because people had talked to him about the church and what was going on there. He knew, yeah, there's all these problems within a church. But he knew that as a group, they were able to share the gospel with the people around them. Uh, Romans 15, uh, 15 through 16. Nevertheless, I have written to remind you more boldly on some points because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, serving as a priest of the gospel of God. My purpose is that the Gentiles may be an acceptable offering, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Yes. You know, and, and Paul in this says, I have written quite boldly. In other words, he's saying, you know, I'm acknowledging that in certain parts of this letter, I was f very frank and very pointed in what I was telling you and why I was telling you it. Uh, but he, he was saying, my teachings were not to reprimand you, but to remind you. You know, he, he wanted to, he wanted the people or the Christians in Rome to understand and be reminded of the love of God for them and their place in God's plan and what they could do as a part of God's plan for here on earth and then what was to come. And the work of the Holy Spirit, he emphasized that a lot in helping them to build themselves up. And he said this task was given to him by who? God. Okay, God, and specifically, Jesus. Jesus. On the road to Damascus, it was Jesus who said, Paul, Paul. And he was given this task to spread the gospel specifically to the Gentiles and teach them everything he knew for them to grow as Christians and spread the gospel also. So what is Paul saying about his purpose in, in the last sentence, if you looked in verse 16? Oh, the last, last half of 16. God did this so that the Holy Spirit could make the Gentiles into a holy offering, pleasing to him. Yes. Interesting, interesting phrase there. Um, how can you be an acceptable offering? Well, the way you live. Pardon? Your beliefs and the way you live. Right, I think. Repentance. Yeah. Grace. Right. Yeah. Repentance and grace. Mm -hmm. Repentance and grace. Selflessness. Selflessness, a life of purpose. Uh, flip back to Romans 12, 1 through 3. Someone read that. Say three. Okay. Was, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Okay. You know, being transformed. 
transformed. Selflessness. The old self has gone away. The new self is there. And using the Holy Spirit to uh, be part of your life and have that, you know, what do we say, if you're going to talk the talk, you got to walk the walk. Right? Uh, I think he was, he was telling them, living a godly life, striving for holiness, uh, you know, giving 110% for God. Uh, that's a sacrifice, uh, that's an offering acceptable to God and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is involved in this, guiding you, coercing you sometimes, uh, popping you upside the head sometimes, letting you know, hey, you're going the wrong way or you've done something or whatever. So, you know, living a life, glorifying God, listening and abiding by what the Holy Spirit is guiding you and telling you, that is what he is saying as being an acceptable sacrifice. Having our lives and our action, our talk and our walk glorify God. Okay, Romans 15, 17 through 19. Therefore, I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey by what I have said and done, by the power of signs and miracles, through the power of the Spirit. So from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. What was the secret of Paul's success in ministry? He gave all the glory to God. Remember, he was always directed by God. Sometimes he wanted to go over here, and what did he say? Well, God doesn't want me over there. He wants me over here. I don't understand why, but hey, I'll get my backpack and here I go. Uh, it was God's ministry and not Paul's. How many times have you seen, read, or whatever else about someone's great ministry? name is in lights and oh he's a great evangelist uh, he's a great teacher or he has this great ministry to the poor or, or in prison or whatever else and Paul never said that he never said did you see what I did over here uh, he never said that he always gave it was God's ministry. It was God that directed my footsteps. It was God that empowered me with the miracles of whatever happened and the words to say. And God protected me. You know, he never even complained about getting beat or shipwrecked or bit by a snake. Uh, I think I would. When he was in prison, and then oh, yeah, in same prison. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, he was always directed by God. Words and deeds. And that's, that was the equivalent back then of saying, walk in the walk, talk in the talk. Mm -hmm. Words and deeds. That would encompass everything. In fact, the words, the deeds, the signs, and wonders taken together describe Paul's entire ministry to the Gentiles. And he said, I've done it from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum, which I had to look up where there, that was. It's on the upper half of Macedonia. If you, I think, it, does, does your books have a map in the back? I think, yeah. Yeah, 
So if you, well, if you look at Jerusalem here, you know, he's talking about going up through Rome, Italy, all the way around, and Illyricum was right above here. And so he was saying it's right above Macedonia. And so what he was saying is that wherever I've been, you know, that's where God's ministry has taken me. And all that time, my ministry was specifically to the Gentiles. Now, did he bring Jews and, and, and evangelize them? Sure. But his ultimate mission was to the Gentiles. And praise the Lord for that. Otherwise, we would be sitting here today. Uh, Romans 15, 20 to 21. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. Rather, as it is written, those who were not told about him will see and those who, will, those who have not heard will understand. Um, it's interesting in that Paul sort of wanted to be a pioneer, didn't he? You know, take me to where there has been no mention of God. No one knows you, and, and that's where I want to be. Uh, you know, too many times people, you know, they want to go where? Be, stay within my state. <laughs> I, want, I want to start a church, but uh, I don't want it to be too far away. Uh, and uh, it was interesting, I guess, in the beginning of my ministry, uh, after I graduated from uh, Southwestern uh, and was applying for positions in churches, uh, they give you this sheet that says where you, you know, what state you would like to be in you know, where you want to go. And so we were in Louisiana at the time. And so, you know, I wanted to stay within a reasonable area because our families were there. And so I was looking for a church somewhere within 100 miles or whatever. And uh, that's what I put on there. Well, after several weeks with nothing <laughs> happening, uh, Barb and I were talking and she said, you know, Maybe we're limiting God. Uh, maybe God has other ideas about where he wants to put us. So I redid the form and said, you know, and I did say, you know, anywhere in the continental U.S., <clears throat> I did not want to go overseas because of our daughters. And within a week, I had a call from a church. So Paul, even in the beginning, said, Hey, I want to go where uh, was the old Star Trek thing that that preceded every show of Star Trek. I mean, Trekkers are in here. Uh, not very many, I guess. Uh, yes, to boldly go where no man has gone before. You know, oh, yeah, I remember that. It was they, I think that was said before each series, you know, to boldly go, that would probably be Paul's uh, saying, <laughs> if he had to say, uh, to go, to boldly go where no man else has ever gone. Of course, he's, what he has said is that uh, it has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known, because I don't want to build on anybody else's foundation. Now, he did say, you know, some will come in and, plant, and, 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 and plow the ground, others will plant seed, and, and someone else will harvest. And I think he had that understanding, too. Some words, sometimes I'm just planting, you know, I'm just furrowing the ground so someone else could come in. Uh, but he wanted to go where no one knew God or had heard God. And sometimes you have missionaries like that, don't you? 
there they go where, gosh, you would say, man, the deepest, darkest part of the, the, the jungle or wherever where Jesus is not known and start a ministry. In fact, he uses part of Isaiah where Isaiah is predicting the coming Messiah. If you look in Isaiah uh, 52, 15, he says, in talking about the Messiah, so he will sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see, and what they have not heard, they will understand. So, you know, did Jesus ever get out of Israel? No. Uh, but Isaiah is saying is that this is going to, the Messiah is going to be all over. And Paul understood this is that I'm doing this for Jesus, for God. I'm an ambassador. And so I'm going to fulfill this prophecy. So that was part of what uh, Isaiah's prediction on the coming of Jesus. Uh, uh, Paul understood what his role in this part was to be in bringing uh, Jesus to the Gentiles. Now in Romans 15, we're going to skip some verses. Romans 15, 22-29, Paul begins to talk about his travels to Jerusalem. He's going to Jerusalem and he's taking the offering from the churches of Macedonia and Acacia to the poor and the church of Jerusalem. They've collected this, this large offering from these Gentile churches and he's taking this offering to Jerusalem for the poor Christians in Jerusalem. So we'll pick up in uh, verses 30 and 31. And he says in 30, uh, 31, I urge you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Pray that I might be rescued from the unbelievers in Judea and that my service in Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints there. Wow, that's really interesting. Here he's going to Jerusalem and he's asking for the church in Rome and the other churches that might read this letter, pray for me. And it's not just say, you know, I want you to pray for my safety or whatever else. He is, he is saying, I want you to urgently pray for me. In fact, the, the phrase to, I think it, it's, uh, to join me in my struggle. Uh, I think some versions may have to strive with me or some other phrase. It was a phrase used uh, in describing competing in an athletic contest or uh, engaging in a military action. You know, it wasn't just something you said. I mean, this had force behind it. I want you to pray for me because uh, this is a struggle and I need your prayers. Uh, and these prayers were for him and his journey and there uh, were two specific items for which he wanted prayer. What were those? Protection. Mm -hmm. uh, protection. Uh, although he, he was pretty specific in that protection in verse 31. Rescue from unbelievers. Yes. Yes, pray for me. And I think in, maybe in some of your verses it may say the Judaizers. Uh, but he, he, in NIV he says that I'll be rescued from the unbelievers in Judea. Uh, he had already had problems from the Jews. They had, remember he had to be rescued by the Roman soldiers uh, when they rioted and they were going to uh, kill him. And then he was rescued again uh, by the Roman soldiers, got him out of town when they discovered a plot 
to assassinate Paul. Uh, why? Why do you think, <laughs> you know, there were a lot of people in, in, in Jerusalem who wanted to kill Paul? Why? Because he used to be on their side. He was a rabbi of right. great distinction and had been persecuting the Christians and now all of a sudden was... He had gone the other side. Well. He was a traitor. Yeah. yeah. We, we had high hopes for him. Right. He was on the fast track. And now, there was revenge involved in that. What's that? There's revenge involved. <laughs> yes, there was some revenge, as uh, David was talking about this morning. Uh, revenge. They didn't like Paul. Uh, he was on the other side now, and not only was he on the other side, what else? He was pretty passionate about it. He was what? He was pretty passionate about it. He was passionate about it, just as he was passionate about it when he was on our side. But he is passionate about what? He called them out. He um, called them out, yes. On their faults. Yep, he called them out on their faults, especially when some of the Jew or the Christian Jews in Jerusalem wanted to make the Christians in some of the other cities practice some of the Jewish uh, rituals. Mm -hmm. and, but the thing that really got them the most was that he went to the Gentiles. That was, that was the worst. Not only did he turn against us and ask, and, and he, he gave the gospel to the Jews and they became Christians, but he went to those dirty Gentiles and said that they could be saved. Yes. Yeah. So they decided that was why the Jews didn't participate with them. That was because, when was it? Way back when, hundreds of years before, when the Jews were taken to Babylon, they stayed. And uh, when they stayed, they intermarried. Mm -hmm. And as a result, the Jews cut them off. And, and what happened? Well, Jesus came through. reasons he was saved. You know, they, they have a long memory <laughs> and they're going to be out to get me. What was the other thing that he asked them for? Can his services be acceptable to the saints? Yes, that his ministry to Jerusalem be acceptable to the saints. Uh, you know, you think, his ministry to Jerusalem be acceptable to the saints. What was he, what was he doing? He was bringing this offering from these Gentiles to the poor Christians in Jerusalem. Who made up a lot of the poor Christians in Jerusalem? The Jews. Why were those Jews poor now? Because they were Christians and they got cast out by the other That's right. Jewish society didn't want anything to do with a Jew that had converted to Christianity. They were kicked out of the family. They had no inheritance. They probably lost their businesses, if they had a business, or they lost their customers. Because remember, you know, the Jewish merchants, merchants you know, they dealt with the Gentiles, but, you know, it was usually the Jewish community who supported them the most. Now they converted to, to Christianity and no more business because I'm sure the Jews, they blacklisted anybody they could. Ah, oh, so-and-so over here has become a Christian. We'll have to find someplace else to buy bread. They had boycotted. Uh, so, you know, some of these Christians who had come from the Jewish faith were in dire straits. And, you know, probably some of the Gentiles, you know, they were slaves or poor or whatever, and, and they were also. So he was wanting this offering to be acceptable because <clears throat> the Jews had 
who had converted to Christianity were brought up how? As Jews. As Jews. And as Jews, you didn't accept anything from the Gentiles because it was unclean. And if you accepted or touched or whatever else, you would have to go do a sacrifice or get cleaned or whatever else. So even though these Jews had converted to Christianity, you know, their history had been one of like this. Now they they had Gentiles in, in the Jerusalem church and so you know they were they were beginning to get along because they were all in the same boat now and maybe they understood a little better what they had been doing and and because of the Holy Spirit they were coming together and so Paul was saying I'm bringing you this offering they know it's from the Gentiles and I want it to be acceptable to the Saints in Jerusalem they're willing to take help from a Gentile church, a Christian church. And what he was saying, if that is successful, that means the church is beginning to unify. What did he say? There is no longer Jew or Gentile, male, female, you know, that scripture would be coming together and there would be unity in the church of Jerusalem for everyone to see. So that was very important to him because throughout all the letters that Paul wrote, one of his underlying themes was unity in the church. You know, because he knew to succeed, to do what God wanted to do, there had to be unity. The barriers between Gentiles and Jews had to be broken down to where they would come together and be one. So this was very important. That's why he was asking them to really get in there and pray that this would come about. Now Romans 15, 32 to 33. <clears throat> so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Okay. So it's almost a prayer from Paul saying, what was he asking here? That they accept him, they accept the gift, and that they accept the peace of God. The peace of God. And also, uh, let's see, uh, and that, so that by God's will, I may come to you with joy and together be refreshed. What do you say? I would like to come to you and report how this offering was received, how, uh, how humble they were in accepting it, and, and how thankful they were in accepting it. And through God's will, you know, I want him to let me come to Rome and report this to you and then we can relax together. Now, he wasn't come to evangelize or anything else. I just want to come, give you this great report, and then we can just celebrate it and relax and enjoy it. And, you know, and, and then they ended up putting him in prison. What's that? But then they ended up putting him in prison. Yeah, well, <laughs> he, he made it to Rome. <laughs> you know, sometimes uh, you know, we'll ask God for something. And he'll grant it to us, but not in the way we expect. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's not like he could get on an airplane and, and go to go to go to Rome. He got to Rome, but it was in uh, the company of a group of Roman soldiers, uh, and he was chained to them. And so, uh, uh, you know, 
he made it to Rome. Uh, so, uh, but here we have, you know, uh, Paul really giving us uh, a good idea of what his ministry was all about and how important it was and how important it was for it to be God's ministry and not his. And how important it was for the church in Jerusalem to become unified uh, because why? Well, that was an important church, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, and it was only in the church of Jerusalem you know, that he was, he was sent out and allowed to go. And, and they had people going from all, all different places through Jerusalem. Jerusalem was a crossroads. And so it was very important for that church to be strong and prosperous in a lot of ways in reaching people. So uh, that was his prayer. Okay, that is the end of Romans. Any questions or comments on the lesson today? When did the Catholic Church start? When did the Catholic Church start? Oh man, I don't know Catholic history. Uh, I mean, the, when you, you're talking about the first Pope? Yeah. Uh, Constantine? Const yeah, I was gonna say Constantine. Yeah. Well, that is the tradition in the uh, Catholic Church, is that when Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church, that it was on Peter. And through him, uh, the emphasis was not on the rock, but on the man and on the foundation. Uh, versus, and the Catholic Church has always said, okay, that person, has to be, you know, the one designated, uh, in, in case of the Catholic Church, voted on or whatever, to be the new rock. When you Google first pope of Catholic Church, it says St. Peter was the first pope of the Catholic Church and remains the unbroken line of popes from St. Peter to St. Francis. Yeah, yeah. So if you, according to the Catholics, Peter was the first pope. I don't think he would ever say that. <laughs> no. He didn't even know what a pope was. Yeah. Uh, and he did go to Rome, but uh, you know, he did not designate himself as the, in, the, in the papal uh, ascendancy hierarchy or anything like that. That just grew out of that. And then you have, uh, you know, the break off of the Catholic. They actually take it from uh, Pentecost. From Pentecost? From Pentecost, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be, you know, the Catholic history is very interesting because <laughs> it's been around a long time. Uh, you know, well, that's what I was wondering, you know. So Constantine came in and overthrew the Roman government, is that what happened? Well, there was a lot of things. Christianity, you know, was persecuted for many years, yeah. and then they had a, uh, uh, who was it, I can't remember, I don't remember all that history back there, but then they had an emperor who became a Christian, uh, was that Constantine? But anyway, all of a sudden it was the accepted religion and spread everywhere. And now how, the St. Peter's and the Basilica, how all that came about, well, I have no idea. You know, probably over many, many years uh, was that consolidated and the, you know, everything was focused in, in Rome as it is today. You know, I don't know. Uh, oh, anyway. but Paul was not fearless. <laughs> yeah. Because he said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. On all those missionary journeys, it, his focus was only on spreading the gospel and yes. being obedient. Yep. And as long as he was alive, that he was, was perfect. It. And at the end, what's my number one thing to do today? You're right. Spread the gospel. Right. And and the number two is where? Okay, here we go. It doesn't matter. <laughs> and it doesn't matter. Uh, that's that's how you woke up every day. Uh, anything else? Well, 
that's just part of it, isn't it? You know, the beatings, uh, imprisonments, or whatever else. Um, that's just an opportunity, <laughs> you know, to tell a bunch of Roman soldiers about God. Yeah. The Edict of Milan legalized Christianity in 313. 313, okay. Um, yeah. That's when we became legal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There is. It, it talks a lot about uh, persecutions of Christians and uh, through the Romans and also uh, the Jewish tax system. Yes. So you know, it's amazing that the Christian church survived the first three hundred years, the first hundred years. Mm -hmm. yeah. Shows you the power of God, and it was only done through people like Paul, who were willing to give it all, sometimes their lives, uh, and maybe only moving it a few inches. Mm -hmm. But when you do it enough, all of a sudden it blossoms. Uh, you know, in the you know. When we ever started a new ministry, we realized that it would probably take at least two years for that ministry to gain its footing and start really making a, a difference. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that's why a lot of people get discouraged because they come up with, you know, they have this great idea, they, God has given them this great idea, and they say, Wow, let's go. And, and I can remember when I was first in ministry, I would have, oh, I want to do this. Oh, this is going to bring in a ton of people. This is going to be a great thing. And it didn't happen. And so you thought, whoa, what happened? You, you know, uh, but it takes a while. It takes a while for, you know, it to be known. You get a few and those few, you know. And so uh, God works in years, sometimes in centuries. <laughs> And we look and say, oh, I've only got a few minutes. And, uh, you know, so we want things to happen. Uh, we're the Burger King Society. I want it now. I want it my way. Yeah. Constantine became emperor in 312. So it took him a whole year oh, yeah. to, to legalize, it. To legalize yeah. it. Yeah. And then didn't his mother have something to do with? Oh, she came yeah, in. She, she came. built churches on every site in Jerusalem. So yes. Yeah. 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 If she thought something significant happened there, she built a church, yeah. Yeah. and they're still there today. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, okay. Anything else? Okay. I enjoyed having it. I enjoyed having an audience today. Thank you. <laughs> oh, let me uh, come up and get a book on Proverbs for next week. Proverbs.